I'm Henrik Jönsson, an independent commentator on current issues in Sweden and abroad. Since 2014, the currency of Sweden, the crown, has lost 40% of its value compared to the US dollar, and it has lost over 22% of its value to the euro. If you appreciate my videos, I'd be honored if you'd support me using one of the payment methods on my left. Without your support, this Swedish libertarian channel would not be possible, so thank you very much for your contributions. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below if you have not already done so, and make sure to click the bell icon, so if you're lucky, you just might receive a notification when I publish a new video, which I do, like a clockwork, every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Central European time. Today, I'm explaining everything about the Swedish crown why it's in free fall, and what that really means. Stay tuned. The last half decade, the Swedish crown has lost 40% to the US dollar and 22% to the euro, and the fall seems to be without an end. Since the 1st of January this year, the Swedish crown has lost over 5% of its value to the euro and over 7% to the US dollar. A few weeks ago, the crown hit its lowest point ever in recorded Swedish financial history and surpassed the latest low point from during the financial crisis of 2008, which prompted financial news provider Bloomberg to tout the Swedish crown as the world's worst performing major currency. How can this be? Sweden, once famous for successful exports like IKEA, ABBA and free love, is now stuck with a currency approaching the fate of Venezuela, Zimbabwe and Turkey. In order to understand this development, you need to understand the basics of how the currency markets work. Here, let me explain. The value of a currency is the result of supply and demand mechanics. The central banks decide the monetary policy and try to balance the value of their currencies by regulating the money supply. This is usually done by so-called quantitative easing, which basically means creating new money in order to increase the supply. This makes credit cheaper and it lowers the interest rates as there is a lot of money moving through the system, which in its turn is hoped to stimulate investment and risk-taking. However, at the other end of the supply stick rests the question of demand. And demand cannot be controlled by the central banks. Let me illustrate how demand affects the value of a currency and vice versa. Country X is a commodity producer. Country Y is an industrial manufacturer. Both these countries need each other's product and trade daily through currency exchange providers. One day, Country Y invents a new machine which solves a big problem for Country X. And all the X-landers therefore want to buy the new machine. In fact, demand is so great that the currency exchange offices have to increase the price of Currency Y in order not to run out when they're flooded with purchase requests from Country X. This is called productivity-based currency appreciation. The Y-landers now start going on booze cruises and shopping trips in country X because the strong Y currency makes it cheap for them to buy things there. At this point, the crooked socialist government in country Y starts paying attention to all the new wealth of its people. They decide they need a bigger part of the pie in order to fund large-scale projects to turn country Y into what their own subjective ideology stipulates as desirable. For the sake of the country, of course. The crooked socialist government establishes complex regulations on how machines are allowed to be produced, they raise the taxes for the productive machine producers, and they implement legislation that moves decision-making from the productive companies into the hands of bureaucrats and civil servants. Several Wildlanders realize that the new rules will make it difficult for their country to be as productive as it used to be. And because they own a lot of currency Y, many of them decide to purchase currency X, which is still cheap for them. This is called going short in the Forex market. And it means that people start betting that a currency 
will fall. As a result of the flood of countrywide purchase requests for currency X, the exchange offices eventually have to increase the price for currency X as not to run out. At the same time, there is more and more currency Y available and therefore it starts falling in value. As a consequence, it now also becomes more expensive for the producers in country Y to buy the country X commodities they need to build their machines. Their profit margin dwindles, and fewer machines get built. As they build less machines, demand for currency Y falls further still. The politicians of country Y are now annoyed that their grandiose plan of engineering a whole new socialist country is seemingly thwarted by disloyal capitalists who are moving their wealth out of the country. They decide to impose trade restrictions to stop the flow of capital from country Y into country X. At this point, the distant countries of A, B and C start to pay attention to what's happening in country Y. The trade restrictions and the political climate makes holding currency Y a high-risk investment and they begin to unload their Y currency holdings. Currency Y is now in self-inflicted free fall. The business sector is first to react and they start moving all their vital components out of the jurisdiction of country Y. This is followed by middle-class private investors who exit the falling currency Y in favor of gold and foreign investments. The politics of country Y harmed its productivity and lowered the global demand for their currency. In a global context, the falling currency means that demand is receding as the market judges the country as a high-risk investment. Which leads us to ask, what's really going on in Sweden? In Sweden, a lot is going on, as it turns out. And this is more important than just Sweden, because Sweden has just gone further down a path that most of the Western liberal democracies are also set on. It's kind of like a canary in the coal mine, except we've also moved out of coal. We've closed all the nuclear power plants and now rely on importing electricity on cold days, which makes the usefulness of this old bird metaphor questionable either way you look at it. This is an X pattern. Well, it, Sweden has one of the biggest and most expensive welfare systems in the world, and it is grossly underfinanced. This has been common knowledge for a long, long time, and it was succinctly presented in book form already in 2012, then under the title of Municipal Path Choices by Lars Andersson and Søren Hegelt. Little has been done to remedy the underfinancing. In contrast, most measures taken have actually aggravated the situation of underfinancing even further. The executive summary of the reasons for this would read More people live longer, which puts high pressure on the pension funds, elder and general health care. Urbanization is putting strain on the infrastructures of major cities at the same time as rural areas face brain drain, depopulation and underfinancing. During the immigration crisis of 2015, some held hope, not entirely without merit, that a flood of young productive immigrants would help rectify the demographic imbalances and refinance the system from the ground up. However, given the overregulated labor market and Sweden's fiercely egalitarian national character, integration has been non-existent. Immigration and employment rates in some areas have around 80%, and the asylum seekers have turned into a massive financial liability, pushing several municipalities deep into the red much earlier than expected. For many citizens, this is a very rude awakening indeed. And not without a sense of betrayal, as many politicians for several years touted immigration as a very profitable affair. First out was the now infamous municipality of Sandviken, which in 2014 bombastically communicated half a billion Swedish crowns in profit due to immigration, but failed to mention that this money was part of a two-year government migration subsidy. Once the government's financial support ended, the municipality of Sandviken turned into a financial disaster. 
The municipality of Kalix is now running a deficit of 34 million Swedish crowns. The municipality of Vilhelmina is now running a deficit of 40 million Swedish crowns. The municipality of Philipstad is now running a deficit of 60 million Swedish crowns. And the list goes on. But this data is not easily gathered, as it is politically unpopular. And migration cost profit calculations long was labeled inhumane in Sweden. Often, we don't know the cost until it appears in the balance sheets to the shock and dismay of our publicly elected officials. Tack för ordförande och väldigt kort. Nej, vi ska inte räkna ett enda öre vad människor kostar. At this juncture, it is important to emphasize that the financial crisis of Sweden and the currency depreciation has not been caused by immigration, but by years of neglecting necessary welfare and labor market reforms. The massive flood of immigrants during the years 2013 through 2017 was merely some spectacularly flammable financial gasoline poured on a fire that had been burning increasingly bright for many, many years. <laughs> former chairman of Sweden's business lobby group, Svenskt Näringsliv, formerly known for an awesome rebuttal of the high tax system, actually attributed by me in an embarrassing hip-hop video available here, estimates a full-blown systemic collapse of the Swedish welfare system within a period of 5 to 10 years. Disregarding Östling's opinions, all of the above, taken together, explain why the global currency markets are shorting the Swedish crown. It is because we're an underfinanced, high-risk investment with several painful and turbulent corrections ahead of us. And Sweden is likely not alone. We've just, as political opportunists of all denominations in our humanitarian superpower like to praise it, come the furthest with these issues. To end on a positive note though, not everything is doom and gloom. Something's not right, too much time has gone by. As the archaic and unreformable welfare systems collapse, it makes space for private enterprise to move in and rebuild the economy. Provided we still have a free economy and don't end up with a totalitarian socialist dystopia when the political class finally have their balls against the walls. Do you think individual freedom and individual responsibility are more important than social engineering and political control? Please share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Do you disagree with me? Have questions or experiences of currency collapse yourself? Please share your input in the comment section down below. I appreciate all respectful feedback. My name is Henrik Jönsson and I believe in free people and free markets. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you.